the organization Carbon Tracker, whose reports are generally pretty somber reading, just put out a report that was so stunning that the word encouraging is hardly adequate. Basically, they wrote that current technology could produce one, 100 times as much electricity from solar and wind as current global demand. Now that is a wow statement. And just last week on April 29th, the California power grid hit 95% renewable power. Didn't last long, but the idea that they could reach 95% on the ISO grid in California is amazing. And the president of the ISO in California said, you know, it sends chills down my spine. It's amazing. Uh, we're getting so much renewable generation online, making a real dent in the state's carbon emissions. This is the, this is the CEO of ISO in California. But we have opponents. The National Gas Association and the New England Gas Association and other utility lobbyists are well-funded and are making inroads with legislative actions across the country, refusing to allow electrification decisions at the local level. And you may have seen some recent news reports, and I think there was one in the Globe, about the leaked documents from Eversource laying out the utilities plan to oppose all efforts for electrification. So what's that old adage that when you're in a hole, stop digging? That's what this is about. Um, we, can't, we know that every investment today in new fossil fuel infrastructure commits us to fossil fuels for another 30 years. It's not just a temporary decision. It's not a bridge. We've crossed that bridge. We're done with this. We need to transition away from fossil fuels. So, we have the technology today and we should be doing, we should now take advantage of our voice to be able to make change happen. Article 31 requires that new construction be fossil fuel free. It's the next logical step in our long strategy in creating a better environment. You know, we, we voted for sustainability principles. Many of you have, were instrumental in that. We voted uh, to divest from fossil fuels, oh, probably, 2014 maybe, um, we voted for Article 51 that sets stringent goals for greenhouse gas reduction and renewable energy supply. We voted to preserve trees, recognizing the value of leaf canopy for carbon capture. We voted for electric school buses to carry our kids to school, ensuring that the air they breathe on the bus and waiting for the bus is not polluted by diesel emissions. We voted to make sure that Concord is resilient to the effects of climate change, but now we need your vote to approve Article 31. It has two components in one vote. We've written a bylaw that would require new construction be fossil fuel free, and it requests through a home rule petition, the authority to implement it. This is the problem that was set out by Brookline last year. They passed the bylaw, but they, they were found by the attorney general's office to be preempted by state law. They didn't have the authority to implement the bylaw. We we're asking the legislature to give us that authority. We and, and about 15, 10 to 15 other towns are doing the same thing. It was recently passed again in Brookline, Arlington and Lexington, and it's on the docket for a number of other communities. Um, we know that we cannot meet our climate goals without this step. Staying the course will not get us to our goals. If Concord residents and businesses consume the same type of energy at the same rate as 2019, even with a carbon-free electricity supply, emissions will only fall 32%. Our goal is 80%. So, this is our moment to start building the future we know we want and that we can achieve. And our job as concerned citizens is not to preserve what we have, the status quo, but build what we want, a better, smarter, cleaner future for our children and a livable planet for all. That's my five minute spiel. And I think, I think you said I get questions at the end of this for anyone who wants all the details on what Article 31 is about. Thank you so much. Did um, I do it in five minutes? I did, almost. That's great. Um, and 
Is there any questions from the audience? We can, uh, well, everybody seems to uh, be comfortable with Article 31. So, um, I'm giving a moment, but uh, okay, why don't we, um, Laura Davis just put something in the chat. We're going to start the announcements with Laura. And I'm just going to find her little square and uh, ask to unmute. Thank you, Brad. So I just put in the chat a link to um, our pledge to vote form. So if you go to that website, you can put in your information and pledge to vote. We're collecting um, pledges so that we can demonstrate how many supporters Article 31 has. Um, and we, you also can sign up to um, help us get the word out about Article 31 on that form. So I hope you will follow that link and pledge to vote. Um, Brad, I also wanted to highlight that uh, Janet Rathrock was waving her hand vigorously oh, at you when you were asking for questions. So I want to make sure she gets a chance to uh, ask her question. Okay. Janet's question is, doesn't the new state climate bill encourage towns to build fossil fuel free by giving them the ability to do exactly what Article 31 proposed? Uh, no, the answer to that is no. The new bill doesn't give any authority to the towns to regulate fossil fuels. The new climate bill um, is going to develop a stretch energy code, which Concord already has, uh, is part of the new, the old stretch energy code. The stretch is now quite commonplace. And the new, we don't know what's in that new stretch code. We don't know if it'll be fossil fuel free. At, when the governor made the announcement, um, when he signed the bill, there was no mention of fossil fuel free or all electric. He said a highly efficient or super efficient energy code. Efficiency is important. We know that. It's the cheapest way to go for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but it only gets us so far. So no, it's not the same. And without the authority to regulate fossil fuels in our town, they may never get regulated because the gas industry is so powerful. Thank you. Okay. Um, what is the, uh, Ellen Quackenbush asks, what is the position of the select board? And uh, if they have not committed to support, what could we do? Um, I do not believe the select board has taken position on articles yet. They usually wait until the end of all the public hearings uh, so that they hear the citizen input before forming their own opinion. They are moving the article, but they have not yet taken a position on the article. When we presented to them you know, at the public hearing and at their their one of their meetings before that, they seem predisposed to support it. I don't know whether it'll be unanimous or not. Okay. And um, Janet asks, what is it that Mike Barrett meant when he said he wants Concord to hold the governor's feet to the fire? Because we don't know what the, uh, the new stretch code will be. The actions of Concord, Lexington, Arlington, all these communities who are asking the legislature to give us the authority to do what's right and what's needed is a compelling message to the legislature that they need to keep the governor, uh, keep his feet to the fire and develop a stretch energy code that is what the communities are looking to do. And so by leading, we are saying we want to see an all electric uh, component to the new stretch energy code. And that by 10 or 15 or more communities representing a large portion of the population saying we want this, it compels the, the legislature to support it and act, act with the governor. Um, now, Janet Lawson says that one of the difficulties is cooking and she um, wants to reassure anybody who loves their gas stove that cooking with induction is even better. Um, and um, really loves her induction range. And everybody who has induction cooking, I'd really be love to see how many people can raise their hands if they do have tried induction cooking. And that's a few. That's, uh, that's great. Excellent. Um, uh, Linda Escobedo says the select board has voted affirmative action on the article. Oh, oh great. Uh, that's great news. Um, 
and great. So, thank uh, you. Linda. Any further questions about the article? Uh, Can I add one thing? And it, it's related to um, induction cooking. So we all are wearing our current hats. This, the Article 31 really only applies to new construction. So most of the new construction that's happening in Concord are from teardowns of existing houses, and they're being built by spec builders. And so it's not like me coming into buying a house saying, I really don't want that stove. This is the house you get. This is the stove that comes with the house. It's not, it's not meeting you know, a particular interest. It's building the future that we really want to see. And you're right, those who cook on induction stoves are converts to, to it. Um, and so I think you know, we are moving in the direction of where we want to be through this legislation. And hopefully we'll get it approved at town meeting and uh, get our legislative authority required to implement it. Okay. Uh, Gilda has asked, what is the benefit of electrification unless we have 100% renewable energy? Well, thanks Gilda. They, actually the answer to that is that we are going to have 100% renewable energy. We own our municipal light plant. We are all the stakeholders and owners. And through Article 51 in 2017, we voted to green that supply to 100% renewables by 2030. And I just had an exchange with uh, Laura at the light plant, who said that she thinks that because, uh, the, because of the current market that we're likely to meet 100% renewable energy supply in Concord before 2030. So the electricity that we will be providing will be 100% renewable. But you saw those numbers without doing more than just providing a 100% renewable supply, uh, that'll only get us a reduction of 32%. We need to do better than that. And that's why this is the next logical step for us is a new construction. Now, um, Kate Hanley has uh, a little bit of an advertisement maybe no if you have questions or need help in going all electric there are some great resources in concord and it's called uh concordcleancomfort.org if you can remember that one long word concord clean comfort uh it is a great website that's been put up uh uh by cmlp and the sustainability division working together um, great and then there's uh, Brian also posted something in the chat. I think, I assume everybody can get to the chat about uh, heating and cooling coaches. That's part of that Concord Clean Comfort program where people will actually answer your questions happily um, to make ch uh, changes. Um, Laura had posted into the chat the pledge to vote, uh, which is uh, at Concord uh, carbonfreeconquer.org uh, take the pledge and if you go that and pledge and you encourage your friends to you'll get a reminder so you won't forget about the uh, uh, the uh, town meeting and you can show up and uh, and support it if you like Gilda you're gonna have to unmute it would be great if you could actually go to that pledge site now and pledge. We we could I Brad and every CCAN gave us a couple of minutes to do that. Thank you, CCAN. Um, because when you pledge, then your name gets listed at, under the um, the list of supporters, and Pete, our neighbors will know. Your neighbors will know that you know about this issue and it will help us get out the vote. So that's why we're really um, trying to get people to pledge now, if you're supporting this, I mean, okay. who you are and thank you. So just click on that link and you get right there. Um, so there aren't more questions coming in. Uh, now's the time for announcements. Um, does anybody have any general announcements about things coming up? Um, I know that Scott does. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Hi everyone, good morning. 
Um, just want to call to your attention a major development project in West Concord that we are trying to stop. Um, you may be familiar with this. It's called 1442 Main Street. And an out of town developer is acquiring the land and wants to build a 16 home subdivision uh, right on Main Street in West Concord. This will require clear cutting approximately eight acres of trees and removing um, 60,000 cubic yards of earth. Basically what they're gonna do is they're gonna take down the entire hill uh, on this property. We uh, fought this at the planning board and unfortunately the planning board did agree to approve the project. So our last line of defense for this beautiful piece of property uh, and everything that lives on the property in terms of the, the, the vegetation and the animals to stop it is at the Zoning Board of Appeals. And the Zoning Board of Appeals is gonna be reviewing this project on June 10th. So there's two things. The first thing is you can go to our website that we've built, which is called Save 1442 Main. That's Save 1442 Main. And you'll see all the information about the project, what the argument is, it links to all of the town documents, et cetera. And then the second thing you can do is we've got an online petition, which I just put in the chat, and you can learn about the project there and sign that petition. There's obviously a bunch of other actions that can be taken, but I just wanna call this to your attention. This would be an environmental disaster right in the middle of West Concord. So we really wanna push back against this developer and convince the ZBA that the earth removal and the tree removal is excessive for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, does anybody ha have any other announcements you can raise your hand? Uh, Stefan Bader. I was um, trying to put in the chat the link for reuse it and Concord Public Works have our semi annual drop off this coming Saturday and we could use a few more volunteers for an hour or two. Any time you can give us will help. And um, there is I'm typing into the chat the link to sign up for a shift. We need some help with styrofoam and oversized waste and a few other things. And uh, if you have stuff to drop yourself, you should be aware that you need to make a reservation for a time slot. Um, and that portal is on the Public Works website and that sign up closes tomorrow. So you might wanna do that today too, as well as signing Laura Davis's pledge, which I did already. Okay, thank you. That's You're a welcome. fun thing to participate in. Pamela. I just wanted to say about 1440, I believe the reason that the it was passed from the uh, the the zoning board is because they could not legally refuse. He switched from his planned residential development, right? So they had to pass it. They couldn't refuse. So we but but the earth removal special permit doesn't have to the language says may even if they i think it's really important what you said that we all should really push back against this because it will make things much worse in terms of our ability to sequester carbon okay very good so uh janet rothrock had a um uh, yeah, um, it's garlic mustard time again. Um, some of us have been um, pushing for a, a more robust garlic mustard pull for years. And um, now we are going to see signs going up. Uh, it'll be for May 15th to 30th. You can get compostable bags from the NRC. Um, I've already gotten, I think 25, no, 35 bags. And I've got 20 of them out and play in my neighborhood. Uh, I kind of jumped the gun because it's really coming out early this year. So um, you can make a difference. It takes about three good years of pulling and then you have pretty much got a small maintenance problem on your hands. But this uh, weed is noxious. 
It's an exotic invasive and it prevents other things from growing in that area because it exudes something from its roots that basically, as I understand, kill the hyphae that break down organic matter and provide nutrition to other plants. So uh, it doesn't have any natural enemies here like it does in Europe where you see one sprig and two sprigs maybe, but then here it with no enemies, it just makes a carpet and burn just Nothing else can compete. So please get out and pull it. Um, look, I won't bother you with a picture because you probably all know what it looks like. Good. Thank you. So uh, I don't see any other questions and we can get to more questions or announcements later. Uh, Haley Overdahl, Orvidal uh, came from the planning board and uh, she will speak to the some of the articles that the planning board has brought forth. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um... Brad, do you want me to start in any certain order? No, um, uh, I'd like you to decide what is most important and... Uh... <laughs> sure, um, so yeah, you know, Brad had three on his list um, that, that are, you know, sustainability related um, to some degree that we'll be bringing to town meeting. Um, you know, one probably much more than the other two, um, that being the earth removal sort of refinement to that bylaw language. Um, but maybe I'll start with the other two first. Um, the first one is uh, related to floodplain um, sort of language. And, and honestly, I, I'm certainly not an expert in it. And uh, it, it, my understanding is it was sort of required language that needed to be updated um, if and followed if you want flood insurance. Um, so it's kind of like state from top down. Um, you know, all communities needed to update certain language um, re related to the, if you were in a flood um, zone. And uh, so there, it's not like a whole lot of discretion, I think, that we had in that. And, and so it kind of is what it is. Um, pretty technical. Uh, so I don't know if anybody has any specific questions on that one. Um, what number is that? Uh, let's see. Article. Uh, let's... 36. Okay. It's a floodplain conservancy district. Okay. So if you're not in a floodplain, probably not relevant. I'm on mute, don't worry. Okay, have fun. I'm gonna get those. Uh, First, we drop off those girls. Yeah, great. Yeah, have fun. <laughs> and so, um, I, I, now, what about the, the what about the other articles? So, um, the next one is Article Thirty Five, and that's some small updates to the preservation bylaw, um, and you know, again, fairly minor. Sorry. Um, I had to mute uh, participants. Sorry about that. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah, tree preservation uh, bylaw updates, you know, pretty minor, but mostly based on feedback after the past few years of it being in place. Um, so it looks like we are adding um, some language around, you know, reinspection fee if, if, demolition or construction hadn't been completed in 12 months from the initial inspection date and then um, protection of an invasive tree if it's to remain on the property um, within the setback areas. Um, so it sounded like we got some feedback that, uh, you know, they weren't being protected if they were, um, you know, in the same way that, that non-invasive trees were and I guess uh, sort of potentially posing harm to neighbor, neighboring properties. Um, so we added some language around that. And then, um, see, tree planting and, and transplanting um, adhering to certain standards. So I think just adding a little bit more teeth to some areas. Okay, very good. Um, does anybody have any questions um, about any of the uh, um, 
articles the, the planning board is putting forward? I got one more, Brad. Um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> and then that's the, that's the article. What number is it? It's the earth removal. OK. Um, one second. Um, let me just find it. Find it here in my notes. Uh, 39, um, earth removal. So this one, we also um, kind of beefed up. I mean, it was pretty, you know, vague and, and um, short. Uh, and so, you know, this one we identified as, as similar to kind of what we did with the PRD last year. Um, we looked at some other town bylaws um, for earth removal and, try to use similar language um, to, to further define, um, you know, certain criteria and, you know, add in considerations for sustainability in, um, you know, evaluation of granting of special permits. Um, so specifically for, I, mean, I think it's greater than a thousand cubic, uh, was it yards um, of earth removal. So like the, you know, the, the significant earth removal, we're trying to add some more criteria or, and clarify, quite honestly, um, some of the criteria for evaluation and uh, with especially focused on um, sustainability related criteria. Very good. Um, yes, I can share the chat. Is there any, uh, any uh, questions that people have? I'll give you, I'll have one question, which is, uh, about earth removal, is there any distinction made in any any laws about the difference between moving a bit of soil, maybe 60,000 cubic yards or something, and uh, removing uh, a big outcropping of, um, you know, bedrock and jackhammering and stuff like that? Is there any distinction made in any of the uh, um, um, I think if if sort of the, the latter of what you described was under a thousand cubic yards at the end of the day um i do not you know i think that that would unfortunately is the way this is um put together and seems to be the standard for, for other towns as well i'm not sure where a thousand cubic yards came from as sort of the benchmark but um you know it would be treated the same whether or not it's more noisy or not, um, as far as the activity related to the removal. So um, once you get above a thousand cubic yards, then you get to consider noise um, and, and you know traffic and other criteria and, and noise, especially to your point. Um, but I don't think if you're under that limit, um, there is uh, as much discretion in the bylaw to consider. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, thanks to to all the speakers. Uh, Ellen. I'm saying unmute. Unmute. So, so, that is, uh, so the same question about earth removal and the, I mean, Scott said it well, we're not talking about just over a thousand cubic yards, but 60,000 cubic yards. Is there a distinction made also for the fact that, you know, given the laws of physics, when you remove earth, you remove everything on top of that. So at least for 1442, the big deal, as Scott mentioned, was not just the removal of the earth, but the removal, clear cutting of a tremendous amount of trees, which increases noise, reduces carbon sequestration. Is that something that the board, the um, you know, natural, the sustainability folks have considered or are going to be putting into this consideration of earth removal. In other words, removing earth means a lot more than physically removing soil. Um, yeah, let me see uh, if I can answer that. Um, I'm just looking at the language here. So again, once you get above a thousand cubic yards anyways. And um, again, that's removing it off site. So if it, 
this ends up having a big impact on smaller parcels, which I arguably I think are going to be, you know, all the big parcels in town have probably been developed. So I think that's why it's even more important to um, have updated this bylaw to make it more clear um, because the smaller parcels can't, you know, move this much earth around the same parcel because there's just not room for it. Um, but once you get above that threshold, um, you know, I think whether it's just soil or trees, um, both will sort of combine into traffic, obviously, and what has to be removed from the site. And so, you know, both will be, both will impact what the traffic study will say. Um, so that's, I guess, one criteria that allows, you know, the evaluation of whether or not it's soil or trees. Um, and, and let's see, we have language around, you know, making it clear that we're trying to minimize changing the natural landscape and natural drainage patterns. So, you know, trees, removing trees and roots will do that. Um, so it should be considered there. Habitat, obviously, will be related to tree removal too. Um, so hopefully there's, you know, some more clear criteria to think about um, whether it's trees or or soils, if if that answers your question. Um, Brian Fools asked whether passage of the Article Thirty Nine would make it impossible for the town to approve future development, such as the fourteen forty two Main Street. Um, well, and I know we're not supposed to talk too much about that that one in particular, but my understanding is that. Um, that application is in and unless it is withdrawn for some reason and resubmitted, um, if this gets passed, it won't, it won't impact um, that ap application. But I also would argue that um, the way it's written today, it's not that I, you know, I, I believe the zoning board has the authority to consider these, these items because there was vague enough language in there with other, I think the term was like other design criteria, which is very broad and vague. And I would argue, you know, the other criteria to our town is sustainability. So what this is doing is just making it much more explicit in my mind anyways. Um, so I, I, I still think that the zoning board has the authority as, as it's written today to consider these things. Um, but technically speaking, you know, only applications that are submitted after this passes would, um, sure. you know, be held to it. Okay. So um, we're done having further questions. We can have questions from anybody to any participant, and you can uh, raise your hand, and I will uh, unmute you. So you can ask it right yourself if anybody would like to. Everybody's. Stefan, did you have a? Brad, there were some some questions in the text early on for Mark, but uh, they came in after uh, right. Alice started. So maybe we go back to those. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going back there. Um, my God, I, it's back there. I'm not sure I'm able to find them. I. Uh, Why don't I just, I'm going to just say, uh, expecting everybody will um, be uh, well behaved, allow people to unmute themselves and ask the question. Because um, I'm kind of having a hard time finding them. Okay, some of the questions are about why is this only, why is the uh, neonicotinoid ban uh, uh, limiting to only new leases as opposed to all leases. Let's see if I can do this. Well, um, it's, a, it's a tough one for farmers because if you're used to farming a certain way using neonicotinoids, uh, switching away from them is not a piece of the cake. I mean, you rely on a certain program for controlling pests. If you don't have that, and uh, 
this is just my own, my own opinion is if you, and, and I've heard other people state this, that if you've been using pest control, when you remove it, you also unfortunately removed the natural pest controls, you know, beneficial insects with the, with the uh, pesticides. So you, it's very hard to raise a crop. And if you're a farmer relying on your annual income, uh, we felt that it was not right to, to uh, that a better way to do this would be to gradually, if it's possible for farmers to do, to gradually modify their approach, not requiring this uh, systemic persistent pesticide. I think the biggest problem uh, before this, farmers used a more toxic uh, pesticide to people, uh, organophosphates, uh, for example. The difference between organophosphates, so they had to be much more careful applying them and they had to apply them more than once because they're not persistent. So if uh, so they might have two days where the crop is poisonous uh, for everything. Uh, and then there's a period of time where nothing can come back because the pesticide has been applied in organophosphate. And then they may say make two applications to control bean beetle or something like that. Uh, so anyway, the, the, to, so the short answer is converting back from neonics uh, is, is something I think farmers would not like to do. I think it raises their costs. And I think it is more, you have to be more careful applying it for people, for their workers and for themselves, of course. Uh, the benefit to pollinators, of course, is before when we had organophosphates, they were only persistent for a few days after the application and not, and they generally, farmers were very good about avoiding spraying anything that was flowering. So uh, the other days the crop was clean and, the, and so if the pollinator visited the plant when it was flowering, it wouldn't typically, typically pick up any persistent pesticide. I hope that's a complicated answer. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. Um, there was a question about how do we counter the idea that because the state has taken action on neonics, we don't have to. Yeah, I I feel that the state. We started working on this article uh, back in 2017. Uh, this, I mean, this regulation from the state. It's taken the state five years to get to the point where they're actually going to implement something. Uh, in general, I think that the, uh, that the reduction is beneficial. There's no question about uh, not being able to sell Munich over the counter. And, and in town meeting, a lot of people ask me, well, what products should we avoid getting? And the product list is pretty long and they have crazy names like Merit, uh, should be called Demerit. But anyway, uh, the, uh, so, this is good for that. In other words, only licensed applicators will put it on. I, I think what I'm concerned about is that I think a lot of folks that have professional lawn services uh, or, or, uh, or institutions that have professional uh, services maintaining their properties uh, may just say, okay, yeah, you know, do whatever you do to make this look good and, uh, and the, it will still become a problem. Uh, and of course, farmers can continue to apply it. I think we need to take a broad view of this, that the amount, if you, if you said that the problem was say a 10, I think what this, uh, this work from the state has produced, reduced it to say a nine or an eight, I think where we need to get is probably down around three. It is the proportion of neonics in the diet of, of pollinators that's the problem and it's too high right now. Got it. Um. I've got a question. I see this time of year, lots of the advertisements from uh, the companies that do uh, mosquito and tick removal from your property. Do any of those use neonics or do you know much about what they use? I think some do do use neonics. Uh, Delia has expressed that concern to me. And, it, and it's a, kind of a shame because uh, Susan Rask gave a talk to our neighborhood about uh, ticks, for example, in a lawn a few years ago. And she said, Deer ticks don't do well out in a lawn, you know, near the verge of a woods, uh, that's where you'll pick them up or in, or in the verge of a woods or off of shrubbery. That's where I used to get my deer ticks. I, I love to get them up here. Um, but, but they would avoid the middle of a field. Uh, you would never need to treat Emerson Field for them because they can't survive. They, they have no way to drink. So when they're out in the middle of grass and the sun is out, uh, they basically desiccate and die. Okay, very good. 
Does anybody else have some questions for any speakers? Hi, um, Mark. I was wondering how we would contact you if we are hiring someone to take care of uh, a pest in our yard, um, how we would contact you to find out if what they're planning to use contains the objects or not. Well, the one, I think one good thing about this uh, regulation from the state is that the person maintaining your yard would be required to indicate to you that what they were planning to do would use neonics. Um, I'm this is right now, <laughs> not when this goes into effect next year. Oh. <laughs> um, we we have the, we have the woolly adult on our hemlocks, and we're trying to get rid of that. With, with woolly delgid on hemlocks, the best thing is dormant oil spray. Uh, get it applied twice a year. Um, and uh, well, one person I know that does it is um, uh, Connor. Connor Gleason, I think, applies it. His company's called Parkhurst Tree. Uh, and there are a lot of others. Just ask them not to put on neonics because neonics are often used against woolly delgid. They, they treat the whole tree. We did that in Canada. Right. 2009, we uh, had a whole hillside drenched with neonix, thinking that that would help the woolly delgid. Uh, uh, so, how, how do you get in touch with Park Cruise Tree? Um, I'll, I'll send it out on the web, but I, I don't mean to advocate any particular person, but I think the trick is uh, dormant oil. I'll, I'll send this out to the chat. Okay, and um, the, the group we've contacted is Stephen Tree. Uh, oh yeah. Um, well, uh, gee, I don't know about save a tree, but I, I have a funny story to tell you about licensed applicators. <laughs> I'm sorry to share this, but uh, no, I'm not sorry. I, I'm delighted to share it. I called up uh, Lincoln Tree, which is a different service, and please don't quote me, although we, it's I guess I've said it out there. And I said, well, you know, neonics are really hard on bees. They said, well, no, it's okay. We just put it on the dirt. You know, and never the bees never get to it. Well, of course, they put it on the dirt and the tree picks it up and puts it in its tree and the tree right. flowers and, and the bees pick it up. And the, since it's so persistent, they apply it to the dirt and it lasts for years. I think it took until 2013 from 2009 for our, uh, our, our uh, Canadian hemlocks that are in Cananum's common land to finally be clean enough that maybe they won't kill bees when they pick up pollen from them. So, uh, yeah, you you have to uh, you have to work with it. I I attended uh, a fellow down here near us uh, who's a farm manager said, why don't you take the pesticide training, you know, for licensed applicators of pesticides for pollinators? And I so I did that. I went up to Chelmsford and attended a one day session with the uh, with those landscapers uh, and other licensed applicators seeking renewal of their license. And Chelmsford, and and uh, I found the attitude of the of the uh, licensed applicators was uh, needed further information. They didn't really fully understand the implications of neonics on bees. They they thought, well, if it's in the ground, the bees aren't going to get into it. Uh, so, Mark, yeah, there was another question uh, from Fatima about. Are the farmers that are prospective lessees already operating in Concord, and what are they what are they currently using? Yeah, the the two properties that the town uh, would be would that would be affected by this bylaw, and this is the hard part. They are farmers. Both of them live in Concord, uh, and both of them have been farming this land before it was owned by uh, other. The, the, the town bought these two properties. One was given to the town. The other one, the town purchased. Uh, they're both agricultural land. They've been farmed for more than a decade in each case by a farmers whose farming technique requires neonicotinoids. Um, there was a question about uh, what tick deterrents do you think are safe? 
oh, um, well, a really good one is to wear boots and spray DEET on them. That's what I do. I'm outside almost all summer long and I maybe get two ticks a season. The worst ones to watch out for are coming up in June when the nymphs are out, they're tiny, they're about the size of a fleck of pepper and they're the one you really don't wanna get bit by. Um, so one is, is wear good clothing, stay away from verges if you can. If you have to go into a verge to prune a shrub or something like that, or work near a forest, then uh, use DEET. Uh, that's a good repellent. Um, I don't know of any non-DEET uh, or uh, you know non-pesticide, I guess, kind of deterrence that I that personally, that I, that I would uh, say. So stay out in open fields, <laughs> stay away from the edge. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's one, there's some very good pamphlets on this. Uh, the state put out one where they recommended a three foot verge next to a forest of wood chips that apparently deer ticks do not like to cross wood chips. That would be worth trying if you have forested area near your lawn. Very good. Um, I think Pamela Britt has raised a hand. You... Uh, yes, thanks. Um, I want to ask why people seem to think that a requirement to announce that you're using uh, neonics on your lawn will be any use since it's exactly like the um, permissions you have to sign that nobody ever reads for uh, joining websites that the they already have to tell you they're using chemicals on your lawn anyway. And nobody understands the implications. I don't think uh, a uh, disclosure, although it's a good idea, is going to be enough to do anything. I also am worried that your kindness to already working farmers is going to backfire because it, it get requiring it only on new uh, leases makes it seem like it's not really that important. We can do it gradually when the fact is we need to stop it now. There's, I looked at this beautiful white flowering tree on Main Street and it had no pollinators. It wasn't buzzing. It was fragrant. It was covered with white blossoms and not a single pollinator that I could see. Okay. I, I don't think you should apologize for the quietness of, of, of that regulation. I think it should be stronger. Not because I wanna hurt the farmers, I don't. Well, but they need to change, right? Yeah, I think you're What's right. What's necessary. Always time. Well, I know when we presented when we presented this article a year ago uh, for last year's town meeting to the um, Natural Resources Commission, the question was asked, "Why not have a sunset clause on all leases that the town makes?" Now the town has about 1,200 acres of farmland, and of that, I think only about 200 are actually owned by the town. And so, even if we restrict it from all the town land. Uh, we're still looking at, say, a thought, well, maybe not quite a thousand because there are a couple of organic farms in, in Concord too, but we're still looking at a substantial acreage that uh, we have no impact on and, and we, don't, we don't have the right to do that. Um, I, think, I think in terms of Pamela's earlier question about uh, homeowners having that problem of visibility, we, I had a neighbor of mine a couple of years ago say to the, to the applicator, I don't want any neonics used. Oh, don't worry. What we're going to do is safe, the applicator said. And then she found out later that they had used a neonic because apparently the applicator didn't even know there was a neonic in the material they were using. So we've got a lot of education to do, I think, I think to be smart consumers uh, when we're looking at a service like a landscaping service. Uh, Mark, one more question. We had a horticulturist at uh, one of the nearby garden centers say that um, dormant oil would not be effective on a tree that is heavily infected. 
trust it. I, I think it depends on when you apply it. Uh, and um, because what dormant oil does is smother the insect. Uh, and because um, uh, I, I know people have used it effectively. The other thing I have found, at least we have a couple of Canadian hemlocks on our property. And it appears that uh, the adelgid comes and goes a little bit. Uh, right now, the plant near our driveway is completely free of them. And it tends to, I th the other thing I've noticed is that it tends to go after collections of uh, hemlocks rather than individual trees. So if they're, if you've got a grove of hemlocks, it's a tough, it's tough. And in fact, right. the native plant trust down in uh, Framingham has cut down their grove of, of, because there was no way to protect it and they felt uh, that was the best thing to do with the land. We've got five in the row. Five yeah, trees in the row, and they're huge. Yeah, I I would still, I guess, I would give it a shot, you know, um, right. so to speak. Um, but find out when it should be applied. I, I've heard two times a year. I haven't right. applied it myself because I haven't had to. Spring and fall. Spring I think and so. fall. Yeah. yeah, we used to use on apple trees and the idea was to catch, you would smother mite eggs on apple trees, but you had to do it before, I think the middle of March because by then the eggs hatch and then the mite would survive. Okay. Janet. I had good luck um, uh, combating ticks using tick tubes. Um, Mark Hansen knows how to make them himself. I just buy them because I think I'd never get around to it otherwise. Um, but they have permethrin soaked cotton in, so it's similar to that, that clothing you can buy, which has permethrin in it. And I think um, some people swear by that. I think Peter Alden does. Wellington boots and permethrin treated clothing. Anyway, I put the tick tubes out. Um, they're spaced about 30 feet apart in a perimeter around the house where I'm likely to be gardening. And the, t the mice will bring the cotton back to their nests and then the ticks die uh, because they, ticks die when they contact permethrin. Um, so you're, all the little rodents become your friends and, and help um, keep the ticks down. So it doesn't, it doesn't work more than about 30 feet away from a, a tick tube, but if you can just put it in, in the area where you're likely to spend your time, it's very helpful. And instead of getting three ticks a week, I get about three ticks a season uh, when I use them. So you put them out once in the spring and once in the fall. Yeah. Vanderhoofs carries them. <laughs> okay. Janet Miller. I read last year a downside to tick tubes, which you might want to think about. And that is the, um, the mice take the cotton ground. In year, they, um, those nice little holes are suitable habitat for bumblebees. So you might be damaging the bumblebee population. Hmm. Just a thought. <laughs> okay. As, as somebody who had anaplasmosis, I would, um, <laughs> I, I, I am a friend of bumblebees. I don't have tick tubes down in my community garden area, but um, I do have a healthy bumblebee population. I, I will, they come to see hyssop in my yacht, in my garden later in the season. And I should, uh, I'll take a picture and, and try to identify them. I know Mark would want to know that. Um, I know, I don't really want to hurt the bumblebees either. But on the other hand, um, it's, I, I've been very scrupulous and I still got extremely ill. I, I don't recommend anaplasmosis. Okay. So I think we are, uh, we've had a lot of good questions. You know who to ask uh, further questions about uh, 
all these subjects. I've recorded um, most of it. I unfortunately didn't start the recording right at the very beginning, and I should have I should have warned everybody. It was something I, I neglected to do, but I also have recorded the chat and we'll be sending around a link to the uh, the presentations and uh, or to the video and the chat for people to look at and um anyway i really appreciate we we all appreciate your coming and uh, we look forward to having more more events like this coming soon maybe one more before the summer i think in june janet I just wanted to make an announcement. There's a move afoot in town to um, put in pollinator gardens, which you probably have heard about for years, but it, it seems to be getting a little bit more focus. I was on a call about a week ago. Mark was there, Delia was there, I was there, only people from Concord, I think, but the, then there were 18 towns represented, 39 people total. Um, and it was run by somebody named Mark Mor Matt Morris, who was with, uh, he was an AmeriCorps volunteer uh, working out of Sudbury Valley trustees. He's now, I think he's left town and working at a land trust. But um, there are short term, middle, uh, short tongue, medium tongue and long tongue bees. There are early, middle and late season bloomers. There are thing, plants that like shade or sun or wet or dry conditions and so on. So um, it's a little bit more comp and you don't want to, you, need, you can't get hybrids. You have to have native plants. So it's a little complex, but I think Mark and, and I will delve into this and um, stay tuned. It should be interesting. Okay. Thank you. Um, any final things other than that? I think it's time to go on with the rest of our days. I uh, really appreciate the people who came to talk and all the good questions uh, and look forward to seeing you all again uh, in the near future. Thank one you, hey, one, Thank one you. last question. Uh, I learned only recently about the importance of soil itself to carbon sequestration and the benefits of not plowing it up. Yeah. And I figure that if I didn't know that, then most people don't. And so I think we also need to include the fact that just that even a thousand when you when you take away the soil, you harm the carbon sequestration ability of the land. Sure. There's a couple of really good documentaries about that. Okay. Somebody put a link to Kiss the Ground and on the chat. Um, I believe, if I remember right, that movie does have a whole lot about yeah. not, not plowing and the benefits of not plowing. Right. Yes. Also, dirt, the ecstatic skin of the earth. Yeah. Um, it changed my view of soil completely just before I had to, I was uh, lead TN on a program at Drumlin Farm, and I was not looking forward to it until I saw that. And then I began to, to realize soil is the key to everything. So go look at it. It was fun. It's, it's a book or a film. Okay. Very good. Um, We'll see you all later. I'm going to shut down and uh, get moving. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.